what's really remarkable about the document that we're going to look at, called the Mandate for Palestine, is that there, it never mentions the word God. And yet, if you are a believer in God, you will see God's fingerprints all over this document. I promise you that. You will see his fingerprints. In the, in the, it's completely consistent with all of, all of his promises. Now, i got some good news for you. Um, I, where we're going to go, first of all, this lady here is a, is a land rights activist extraordinaire. I'll tell you just a little bit about her. Sits on, she's a member of the Toronto Zionist Council. Um, she has uh, attended my, my very first live training. And this is going back, I don't know, almost two years ago now. And she wrote me. Now, this lady worked with Howard Grief. Howard Grief wrote the definitive work about Israel's land rights. It's an 800-page book. Don't ask me the title right now. He's now deceased. He was a Canadian lawyer. He went into Britain, went to Britain, and looked at the source documents. Now, he eventually passed on, but before he died, Renana and her husband Joe created a beautiful petition that was actually made it into the Canadian Parliament and presented to the Canadian Parliament. So this lady knows Israel's land rights. And this is what she wrote to me the next day. All my life, I never had a copy of my country's land title deed until you put one in my hands. Your support, understanding, vision, and belief in us gave me the courage to stand up as a proud Jew. And I thought to myself, wow, imagine if I could du duplicate that experience 10,000 more times and we had 9,999 more Jews out there who actually understood their country's land title deed, understood the promises of the world, and knew, nor, more importantly, what to do with it and how to use it. So that's what I do. Okay. Um, next one, please, uh, Ian. Great, wonderful. That's her speaking at one of my conferences. What we're going to do today is we're going to uh, talk about, so that the first part is, you're going to be able to answer the question, I hope, are Jews owners or occupiers? And you're going to do it from a secular perspective, because the world's secular, right? That's the world we're living in. Those are the people who are tormenting us, for the most part. So, you're going to understand how to do this. So, you're going to be able to answer that question, are Jews owners or occupiers? Then you're going to need to know, well, how do we use this information to take, to take charge of the narrative? I'm going to talk to you about a ta the tactical deployment of a moral narrative. And when I say tactical moral narrative, I'm talking about how do you and I use it when we're interacting with other people. And then I'm going to show you a strategic use of it. In other words, what could Israel do with this and the power of that? Okay, so that's where we're going today, and we'll get some questions and objections. And I will stay here as long as it takes to get everyone, um, every question and objection answered, because overcoming objections is important. It's very important, because they're going to say, yeah, but what about this? And we need to know how to respond. So, here we go. This is how I make decisions. When people come to me and say, well, what about this, and what about this, and we should do this and that? Okay, first we talk about truth, not solutions. The problem is is that too many people want to jump to solutions. You can't build a house on a foundation of lies. It's not possible. If, you, if you're lying about something, if, and uh, if you're lying about stolen land, or you're lying about history, how do you build truth on that? If you're going to try and pretend that, well, gee, you know, yeah, I know they, they murdered our athletes and slit our babies' throats, but if we give them this, now we'll have peace. Um then you're deluding yourself until you address those issues in a substantive way. And there are people in your community in particular and that think that if we just find the solution. Well, no, I want to talk about the truth. Let's talk about the truth. Because once you have the truth, then you can find, you can find the real solution. It's like a divorce, okay? If one, if one guy's cheating on you and you don't know that, how are you finding a solution to that? You're just not going to do that. So my core principle, and you'll see this come in as we go through this stuff, is truth before solutions. Stop talking about truth, or stop talking about solutions and start focusing on truth. Are Jews owners or not occupiers or not? Did the world make promises to the Jewish people or not? Did the world keep the promises to the Jewish people or not? Can Jews trust a new solution based on the history or not? That's, those are the only things that matter. Okay, so that's where I go. 
We're going to argue morality, not legalities. Now, there are people in the world who understand this document, the League of Nations. They understand the mandate. They understand the, the history of it, and it's, and it's awesome. What I understand is how to use it as a counter-propaganda method. How do you use this not to get into a legal debate, but into a moral, a moral debate? It's not the legal war we're going to win. It's, it's going to be the moral argument. Because if you think about what has happened to Israel, an entire narrative has been completely fabricated out of thin air. And where is their mandate for Palestine? Well, they have mandates for Syria, and we'll talk about that in Lebanon. But your enemies have fabricated a whole narrative. They had no legal rights at all. And yet, here we are. So they managed to use very, very good propaganda to attack Israel's legitimacy. Very effective. So, number three, the document is enough. By that, we don't have to argue ancient history. We don't have to argue um, <clears throat> archaeology. We don't have to argue sociology. We don't have to argue any of that stuff. The four corners of the document are enough, and I'll tell you why. It's as simple as this, because you're going to have questions. Everybody has questions, but it's simple as this. The document exists. The world made promises to the Jewish people, and they're in black and white, and this is the document. The document alone proves that Jews didn't just wake up one morning and steal a bunch of land that didn't belong with them. They were encouraged to rebuild their national home. We're going to get to that. Preach to the choir. Everywhere, like I'll have people say, oh, Mark, you know, we've got to stop preaching to the choir. I said, well, that's only true if the choir is all singing the same notes from the right book uh, at the same time. And as we're going to see in a few minutes, that's not happening. So my mission is not to go out and convert any haters. My mission is to arm ordinary people who are friendly to Israel, who care about Israel, with the facts about Israel's land title deed and how to use it. Okay? So I preach to the choir. My mission is to train the choir. Okay? That's my mission. There will be other people who want to go out and go head on and meet the haters. I don't do that. Because we're going to have a, our target market, we're not going to convert the haters. All we can do is use the haters so that if we're online, we can say to a hater, for example, um, they'll say, occupation. And I'll say, have you read Israel's land title deed, the mandate for Palestine, and here's the link. Okay, why am I doing that? Am I doing it for the hater? No. I'm doing it because I want to leave breadcrumbs for the normal people. That's what I'm doing. I'm leaving a place where they can get information about what I'm saying. And then they can make a decision as to, is Mark full of dog do or not? And so that's what I'm doing. I'm not trying to convert any haters. Um, be a sorter, not a convincer. It's kind of the same thing with the, with the target market. I don't try to convince anybody. There's an old sales saying that goes, amateurs convince and professionals sort. So in other words, the amateur salesperson goes, I'm selling a house. You want to buy a house, don't you? Here's a great house. I want you to buy this house. It's a good house. You want to buy this house? The sorter comes along and says, excuse me, I have a program for first-time home buyers. Um, are you interested? No, thank you. Excuse me, I have a, I have a program for first-time home buyers. Would you like to come to a seminar? No. And we sort through them. So if I'm using that on the Israel side, if I'm in a group, let's say I'm five people in a, in a, a, a university, and I'll say to the, you know, maybe I'll say to the leader, listen, I have a document that proves everything you've been told about Jews stealing land is wrong. Would you be interested in seeing it? If I could show you that document, would you be interested in seeing it? Hell no. Thank you. Excuse me. I have a document that proves uh, Jews didn't steal the land. Would you be interested in seeing it? No. Excuse me. Um, I have a document that proves, okay, I got the idea. Yeah, I'd be like to see it. Thank you. Come with me. That's, how, that's what I'm talking about, sorting, not convincing. All right. Talk about leaving breadcrumbs for normal people and using the language of truth. I don't want to hear today West Bank. I don't want to hear about settlements. I don't want to hear about settlers. I only want to hear about Judea and Samaria, or if you prefer, reclamation movement, liberated area, communities, citizens. No settlers. No, no disputed occupied territories. Why? I hate to tell you, I had a meeting with a leader from 
the liberated areas. And, and this person's very what, quite well known. I said, you got to stop calling yourself settlers because in a modern context, it raises the issue of colonialism. It implies that you were not there before. It implies that you're getting there for the first time. It's, it implies, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't tell you that you're, you're rebuilding something, hence reclamation movement. So you're using the language of your enemies when you're using these. And you're also using language that does not convey truth, as we're going to see with the document. Next, please. Okay, why, why do I like the mandate so much? First of all, it's an act of international law issued by the world. Okay? It's, um, Balfour Declaration was not an act of international law. It was, it was just the spark. We'll talk about, a little bit about the history in a bit. It was a little spark, that, a big spark, that led to something called the San Remo Conference and eventually led to the mandate for Palestine. So this is where I need to know something, ask you another question. How many of you have, how many of you have heard of the Balfour Declaration? Everybody. How many, of you, how many of you have heard of the San Remo Conference? Most, some not. Okay. And how many of you have heard of the Mandate for Palestine? Okay. A lot of you have. How many of you have actually read the words of the Mandate for Palestine? How many of you read it? There you go. So four. Okay. All right. Well, that's consistent. I've trained now, you would be 475 people. And those averages are consistent. Only 2% of the people that I've ever trained have ever read the words of Israel's land title deed before we, before we met. And we're going to change that. The mandate is very easy to read. It's very easy to learn because it's written in plain English. You can't mistake what it says. And it's very easy to teach and share. So by the time we're done today, you're going to know where to find, where to find, the, where to find the mandate, what kind of the basic clauses, we're not going to read every one of them. And you know what? I can train anybody to say, when they say occupation, I can teach you, well, no, Israel has a land title deed from the world. Would you like to read it? Okay. Now, it's a little more complicated than that because I'm going to teach you some role playing. But that's the essence of it. It's all in this booklet. It's easy. It allows us to, it, you know, and I talked about it being secular, but complements Torah and Bible. So let me just say that again. Um, you're not going to find God in this document at least by name, but you will find his fingerprints. If you're a believer, you'll find his fingerprints in the mandate. They're all over it, and it's an amazing document. It allows us to take charge of the debate. It really does, because now we have something to say. Like if I ask most people, uh, and I'm not going to put you on the spot, what do you say when they say occupation? Uh, I don't know. Occup uh, we want peace. Okay. Uh, we, we really want peace. Okay. Another guy might say, well, Torah gave it to us. You know, if you're very religious. Okay. This allows us to put people on the defensive using a secular uh, argument and puts us on the high road. And it directly, can't emphasize this enough, directly refutes the stolen land propaganda. I went up, I had three go-rounds with a professor of international law named Nathaniel Berman on Isra Pundit. Who's heard of Isra Pundit? Isra Pundit dot... Okay, I thought more would have, but okay. Uh, Ted Baum, great guy. Uh, he's spoken in Toronto on occasion. And uh, he published uh, this Nathaniel Berman's arguments about, you know, kind of denigrating Israel's land rights, really, including the mandate. And I said, well, we're not going to let that go unchallenged, are we? So I wrote my first piece, and Ted sent out, out to all of his mailing us. He said, well, I was afraid to get into this, but my friend Mark from Toronto or from London, Ontario, Canada, got into it, so let's read it. I had three go-arounds with this professor of international law. I have no legal training other than what I had as a real estate agent, real estate broker. But you know what? I got a logical mind, and I got a history of mounting, winning counter-propaganda, so um, my argument really boiled down to this. I said, you can make, you can use all the fancy Latin phrases you want, you can talk about the ripening rights of self-determination all you want. But what you're not saying to me is, the document doesn't exist. You didn't take, say to me, Mark, the mandate for Palestine never existed. You never said to me, um, gee, Mark, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the um, um, you didn't say to me uh, that 
the world did not make promises to the Jewish people. You didn't say that to me. You didn't tell me that, gee, the world kept those promises. You didn't tell me that Jews didn't die because the world didn't keep those promises. You didn't say any of those things to me. So you can use all these Latin phrases all you want, but the bottom line is, is that the only thing that you've accomplished through our interaction is proving that Jews can't trust the world's promises. So I thank you very much for that. And I said to him, and if Jews can't trust the promises from the original two-state solution, which you're going to find in here, we're going to talk about that one, why should they trust the solutions in a new two-state solution, the promises in a new one? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And that is a great foundation for you to learn. You know, um, uh, Jews should be able to trust the world's promises. That's a moral argument, shouldn't they? Shouldn't we all be able to trust the world's promises? I mean, if the United Nations decided tomorrow that we're going to divvy up some land and we're going to make it happen and it's got a, and this is the document, shouldn't the Arabs be able to trust those promises? Shouldn't the Jews be able to? Well, sorry, but the world made promises back in 1922 to the Jewish people. Shouldn't those promises be held? So that's where we're going to go. Next. Okay, so here's our enemy's narrative. Jews stole our land, are illegally occupying it, so we have the right to kill them in self-defense to end a brutal occupation, and when they kill us, they're committing war crimes. That's, a, that's the essence of this, the, of your enemy's narrative. True? Isn't that, their, isn't that the occupation? Occupation, occupation, occupation. And when you, when you go, when you get down to all the things about the wall, and the conversation's always about occupation, Okay? So let's go to the next one. Menachem Begin, at all times and whatever cost, safeguard the dignity and the honor of the Jewish people. I take that really literally. And that is my mission, to do that. And I think given what's happened to Jewish people, what the world's done to Jewish people, we all have an obligation to do that. Okay, here's our side's narrative. So this is what most Israel advocacy involves, revolves around. Okay? We need the land for defense. Israel's gay-friendly. Israel saved lives in hate. Israel contributes to medicine and technology. Why not criticize Iran and Syria? They're worse than, worse than Israel. Israel's the only democracy in the Middle East. Israel's only defending itself from terror. We don't have a peace partner. Now, I, did a, I spoke at an event at Ryerson University, and Salomon Ben Zimra from Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights was with me, and he said to, uh, he asked the the organizer, what are you guys taught to say if somebody says occupation to you? Well, we have to say, well, we don't have a peace partner. And that's it? You don't have a peace partner. Right. What's missing from that list? The core of their argument is occupation. And yet, almost none of your counter-propaganda <coughs> narrative counters that occupation. They're accusing you of stealing land and ethnically cleansing people, and yet imagine going into court with this argument. Now it's neighbor, the you know the, the Arab neighbor to Yossi, you stole my land. So now they're in court. Okay, I'm a doctor who cured cancer, and I saved lives in Haiti, and my neighbor is anti-Semitic. So you're in front of the judge now, okay? You're in front of the judge, and you've been accused of stealing land. And my neighbor's anti-Semitic. His other neighbor beats his wife. So what's he criticizing me for? I need this land as a defensive buffer against the wife beater who lives on the other side of him. My relative lived in this area a long time. Yeah, I threw some rocks at him after he tried to hit my kids. But I warned them to get out of the way so I wouldn't hurt them. And, but you know what? I really, really want peace. So why don't I give half of my house, my land, to my neighbor? Would that be okay? That's your advocacy. Whether you like it or not. Now, here's the other option he could use. Excuse me, Your Honor. This is a copy of my land title deed here. Uh, could you arrest my neighbor for uh, uh, throwing rocks at my kids and uh, give me a protective order to keep them out? And then maybe we can build a working relationship once the violence and the intimidation works. When you go in front of the world or court and you ignore the core allegation of occupation, you're essentially saying, yeah, I guess we're occupiers. Because you're not confronting, you're not dealing with this, this core problem. You've got to deal with that. 
Um, so Zoe's a political science student. She just got in there. She's been at university for a couple of weeks, and she's already been corralled by the people, who, you know, who want to, you know, tell her how how Israel's evil and they're oc illegally occupying land, stolen land, and all that stuff. And she's going to be president one day. Okay. She is never going to believe that Jews and Israel are okay as long as she thinks that you're land stealing monsters. No amount of good news stories. I love the good news stories. I'm glad people make them. So I'm not condemning them. But I'm saying, in addition to telling people all the good news story, you got to confront the occupation narrative and what better way to do it than through your land title deed. So it would be my argument to you that the occupation narrative has to be destroyed no matter what solution you favor. Now you could you could say like some other people, all right, Mark, that's pretty radical. Truth is never truth may be you know, it may seem radical, but if you're in a situation where truth seems radical, you've got a serious problem. And the last thing you ought to be doing is giving away half of the heartland of your country uh, to, to nice people who have murdered you and attacked you and terrorized you and falsely accused you of crimes. So you got a bigger problem. If you can't talk about truth, uh, that's your problem. So Mandate for Palestine. Okay, so the first part of the booklet is your land title deed. That's the actual copy of Israel's land deed. I rewrote the entire mandate and positioned it pretty much the way it was on the original document. So essentially what happened is, many, many years ago, in A.D. 135, the Romans really were not happy about that Bar Kokhba revolt. And they were really mad at the Jews. So they renamed Judea Syria Palestina. Palestina, whatever way you want to pronounce it. Now we fast forward through the Ottoman Empire and World War I comes along and the Allied powers defeated the Ottoman Empire, they defeated the Germans, and then they had to decide what are we going to do with the land in Europe and in the Middle East. So they held a, they held a conference, it's called the San Remo Conference. Now Balfour Declaration was in 1917. The San Remo Conference was held in 1920 in San Remo. So they held this conference and they heard claims. They heard claims from the Arabs, they heard claims from the Jews, and they had to decide what they were going to do. President Woodrow Wilson had given a speech. He called it the 14-point speech. And in the speech, he, they wanted to end colonialism. They wanted to make sure that these developing countries had a chance to get built up again. And, and become independent states. He actually got a Nobel Prize for the League of Nations, and in, it, in the citation it mentions this fact, that he wanted to uh, essentially liberate oppressed people. That, those, are, those are the words that, that he used. So they came up with this plan uh, for a mandate system, and they were going to, uh, so some countries would get more help, some countries would get uh, uh, less help. So what they did is they divided uh, the Middle East and Lebanon and Syria became a mandate. Israel, or well, Palestine became a mandate. And Palestine was always Jew. So if somebody wants to talk to me about, about, uh, about uh, you know, the Palestinians weren't there. Yeah, they were there. The Jews were there. They were always, the Palestinians were always the Jews. And that's because the Romans named the Jewish state Palestine. So the simplicity of this uh, rewriting of history is just mind-boggling to me. It's a, uh, the audacity of it. So they divided up the, the countries, and Mesopotamia was supposed to be a mandate, but they ended up uh, uh, you know, appointing a king in there instead. And there were a number of other countries that were also treated as mandates. Uh, Papua New Guinea is a mandate, Togo, um, Cameroon. There are a number of them. Now, you'll notice, you'll think, well, Mark, I thought it was just the Jewish state that got its borders criticized, and you would be right. So for some reason, out of the 14 countries that were created by mandate system, only the Jewish borders are questioned. Only the claims of the Jewish people are being delegitimized. I wonder why that could be, he said. Now, the Allies also, because we're going to deal with objections later, the Allies, you know, you're going to say, well, colonials, they had no right to do it. Um, well, they divided up most of Europe. Poland didn't exist at the end of World War I. Poland was created. And so there were a number of borders in Europe were draw, redrawn. 
And they had the absolute legal right to do it. They were the victors in the war, and uh, they signed a number of different treaties, which I won't bore you with. Um, and Palestine was just one of these borders. Okay, So the Arabs got the bulk of the land in the Middle East. I don't have to tell you that. And Jews got this little sliver of Palestine, which they immediately renamed Israel to go back to their, go back to their roots. So... In 1922, the world issued this document, the Mandate for Palestine. So you're going to see League of Nations Mandate for Palestine, together with a note by the Secretary General relating to its application to the territory known as Transjordan under the provisions of Article 25. 24th of July, 1922 was the actual date that it was approved by the League of Nations. Okay? So there are two parts of this document. The first part is the actual land title deed that where they set out what Palestine slash Israel is supposed to be, why it was created, it sets out different requirements. The second part of the document is this note regarding Transjordan. So guess what? Transjordan, which is today Jordan, also was created by the mandates process. But nobody criticizes the borders of Jordan, and I can't figure out, I know there aren't any Jews in Jordan. Could that be it? I think it could be. And so, let's go over to page 14. Mandate for Palestine. I have emphasized some clauses in here to help you, you know, we're not going to read every single clause, but you'll see the ones in bold italics, those are the ones that are really critical. And so what's happened is, the League of Nations, they've agreed for the purpose of giving effect to the provisions of the covenant of the League of Nations, because Article 22 of the covenant establishes the mandate system, which Wilson uh, intended. That's what he wanted to have happen. So let's look at the second paragraph down. Whereas the principal allied powers have also agreed that the mandatory, now the brand mandatory is going to be Great Britain should be responsible for putting into effect the declaration originally made on November 2nd, 1917 by the government of His Britannic Majesty. What document is that? Exactly. Not by name, but clearly that's what they're talking about here. And that document was the first time that any nation had expressed support for the reestablishment of the Jewish, Jewish nation. Okay. And... It was in favor of the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. Now, it also goes on to talk about protecting non-Jewish rights, because okay, they were concerned about that. Now, this next one, the third paragraph down, whereas recognition has thereby been given to what? The historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine and to the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. Do you get what they're talking about here? It's not that somebody decided out of the goodness of their heart, we're going to make a home for Jews and where can we put it? Ah, Palestine. We're going to put it there. Because that will really annoy the Arabs. We really want to put it there. No. Recognition has been given to the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine. That's why I don't have to argue 5,000 years of history. I don't have to argue archaeology. The world decided and recognized that the Jews are the historical uh, owners of Palestine. Isn't that neat? And it doesn't only, it doesn't stop there and to the grounds for reconstituting. It doesn't just say build a home, reconstituting. So we recognize that the Jews have an ancient tie to this land. We recognize that they have something to rebuild. We want you to rebuild your nat. What? Your national home in Palestine. That's remarkable. Remarkable statement. Now, we're going to go down to the next bolded one, closer to the bottom, and it says, Whereas his, Brit his Britannic Majesty 
has accepted the mandate in respect of Palestine and undertaken to exercise it on behalf of the League of Nations. Now, how many of you have heard the phrase British mandate? A lot of people have heard that phrase. Okay. So you'll sometimes get that with people who don't like Israel, and they'll say, the Brits had no right to divide up that land. It it was a British mandate. And uh, no, the world decided that recognized the Jewish homeland. The world decided it should be reconstituted. The world decided that you should rebuild your national home. That's what they decided. And Great Britain, it's not the British mandate. It's the world's mandate. So that means that all of the promises and statements in this document, they're not from just one country. They're the world's promises. And the only nation, major nation that wasn't part of the world, uh, a part of the uh, League of Nations at the time this was filled, and it's very ironic, given uh, Woodrow Wilson's uh, statements and, and, and energies in wanting to try to create ins- inspiring inspiration to create the League of Man- Nations, was the United States. They had a bunch of squabbling, and they did not join the League of Nations. However, they passed a document. They have a treaty with Britain, actually, called the Rights in Palestine Convention. They recognized the, the mandate for Palestine. So this is incredible stuff. When I first read this document, I thought, I, like, I was like many people. Oh, the United Nations created with 1947 and, and, 19, and then with the resolution in 1940. No, no. And this is the ultimate expression of the Balfour Declaration. And I try to tell my Jewish friends this. Balfour is a great spark, but it is not international law. It is a statement by one nation. Wonderful statement. But the, San, the law was made at the San Remo Conference And they heard all the claims. The Arabs made their claims. The Jews made their claims. Everybody got heard. And this is what they said. That we're going to rebuild. We're going to let the Jews come and rebuild their home. I think that's pretty cool. So we're on Article 2. The mandatory shall be responsible for placing the country under such political, administrative, and economic conditions as will secure the establishment of what? Jewish National Home. Thank you very much. And it also talks about safeguarding the civil and religious rights of all uh, the inhabitants of Palestine, irrespective of race and relation. There were no political rights granted to the Arabs. Now, why would that be? Can anybody think of a reason? Because they got all the rest of the Middle East. There already were mandates for Syria and Lebanon. There's already, uh, eventually... Jordan was created. So they got Jordan. They got Mesopotamia. And the Jews got this tiny little sliver of land. Okay? They didn't need to have their own state. Because they had their own states. All recognized by the world. So the same world body that created the borders of today's Iraq and uh, Jordan and and Syria and Lebanon. um, Well, that's okay. But the one little Jewish state, that's a problem. There's something wrong with that. So let's keep going. Article 4, an appropriate, what kind of an agency? Jewish Jewish agency, shall be recognized as a public body for the purpose of advising and cooperating with the administration of Palestine in in such economic, social, and other matters as may affect the establishment of what kind of homeland? Jewish Jewish national home. And the interests of what population? Jewish. Jewish population. In where? Palestine. The Zionist organization shall be recognized as such an agency. Okay? Now, Article 5. The mandatory shall be responsible for seeing that no Palestine territory shall be ceded or leased to or in any way placed under the control of the government of any foreign power. Now, if you're somebody like me, I served in a UN peacekeeping mission, so that's how I know. I know a little bit about, a little bit about the UN. Now, if you think about that, and I always thought, well, you know, the UN created this partition plan, and that inspired the Jews to create self, you know, independence, which may have been partly true. But if you think about it, let's see, the mandate was still in force at the time that partition plan was being put forward. But yet this article says, no Palestine territory shall be ceded to or placed under the government of any foreign power. 
So, Mark the non-lawyer has to wonder, did anybody have the right to divide, to partition Palestine in 1947? I would say probably not. However, it's a good question, though, isn't it? The administration of Palestine, this is a good one, Article 6, because this is the one that really got a lot of Jews killed because it wasn't upheld. The administration of Palestine shall what? Shall facilitate what? Jewish immigration under suitable conditions and shall encourage close settlement by what? On the land, including state land. So, hang on a second, guys. Do you, do, are you understanding already that the existence of this document, no matter how you want to interpret it, no matter how you want to try and cast aspersions on the people who drafted it as colonialists and whatever, the one document, this is from the world, and it makes it clear. Jews were encouraged to rebuild their national home, they were encouraged to rebuild it and go there, and that's in Article 6. Okay? Now think about what happened during World War II and the, up, and, the, and the time leading up to World War II. The British military, they were getting grief from the Arabs, and they didn't really like the idea of these Jews coming into this land, even though the Jews had been there since, what, in the 1800s, started buying up land and... Uh, you know, from, from absentee landlords uh, from the Ottoman Empire. So there was a lot of violence against the Jews. So the British decided that they were just going to keep the Jews out and everything will be fine. The British had no right to keep the Jews out because the whole purpose of this document, which they were assigned, they were assigned by the world with the responsibility of helping Jewish people rebuild their national home there. They kept the Jews out. I, I mean, I, when I was writing some of the, some of the, some, sometimes, I've got to ask, like, I, I don't know what number to put on it. So I finally settled on countless. How many Jews died because Great Britain did not honor Article 6 in this document? How many Jews died because of that? And nobody has asked them for an apology. It's outrageous to me. It's outrageous, okay? Um, number 7. There shall be included in this law provisions framed so as to facilitate the, acquis the acquisition of Palestine citizenship by who? Jews. Jews who take up their permanent residence in Palestine. So for anybody to argue that Jews weren't supposed to have a state and Jews weren't supposed to be settling, they're, they're full of dog do because it's right here in the black and white. Right here. Article 11, the bolded. The administration may arrange with the Jewish agency mentioned in Article 4 to construct or operate upon fair and equitable terms any public services, works, any public work services and utilities and to develop any of the natural resources in the country. Jewish agency. Jewish. Jewish people. Jewish agency. Jewish everything. Okay, let's go to Article 13. Nothing in this mandate shall be construed as conferring upon the mandatory authority to interfere with the fabric or the management of purely Muslim sacred shrines, the immunities of which are guaranteed. So the framers of this document heard all the claims. They recognized the Jewish claims to the land. They recognized, they encouraged the Jews to rebuild the land. And they made provision for Muslim, the protection of Muslim shrines. Isn't that, that's a good thing. Article 15, no discrimination of any kind shall be made between the inhabitants of Palestine on the ground of race, religion, or language. Article 25, in the territories lying between the Jordan River and the eastern boundary of Palestine as ultimately determined, the mandatory shall be entitled with the consent of the Council of the League of Nations to postpone or withhold application of such provisions of this mandate. So, what does that mean? In the territories lying between the Jordan and the eastern boundary of Palestine, as ultimately determined. So what does that tell you? We know for sure, although it says the borders of Palestine were not officially determined. I mean, you can you look at the, like, you'll, you'll see people, they'll show Palestine as, as including all of Jordan. But it really didn't. 
but it's, it's a little bit awkward to explain. But we know for sure, based on the wording of this clause, that the Jewish Palestine was to include land east of the Jordan River. Okay? We know that, because otherwise they'd just say, they would just say, we, we don't, it's just going to be up to the Jordan. They didn't say that. They said the eastern boundary of Palestine, which was going to be the Jewish home, would be it's east of, east of the Jordan River. And they reserved the right to withhold the right of Jews to settle on that land. So, again, from this one document, this clause alone tells us that Palestine included, which was the Jewish national home, included land east of the Jordan River. Now, why would they do that? Well, got a map. This is the map of what of the claims that the Zionist organization presented to the people at the, to the to the Allied powers at the San Remo conference. They claimed a land, you know, part of the Golan Heights and then a strip of about 10 miles or so on the eastern border mainly. I mean, we can look at the western border, but that's not really an issue right now. But on the east of the Jordan River, the Zionists claimed land um, about 10 miles or so. And that corresponded with the ancient tribes of Israel. So it was a perfectly reasonable request to make. So what, the, what Article 25 is saying is that any land that was promised, supposed to go to the Jews as part of the mandate, which, would have been, which extended out here, so they had the right to withhold settlement west of the Jordan, east of the Jordan River. Now, notice that it does not say Jews don't get Jerusalem. Jews don't get this. Jews don't get that. They had the chance at the time they drafted this document. Any lawyers in the room? Any lawyers? Okay. The, per the person who drafts the contract, it's interpreted against them. No, no, I like lawyers. Lawyers are good. You don't have to be afraid in this room. This is good. Okay. So, so they had the chance to put in this document, Jewish settlement will be divided between Arabs and whatever, and, and, and Jerusalem is excluded. They had the chance to do it. They didn't. All they said was they could withhold Jewish settlement from east of the Jordan River. That's all it's said in here. Okay? There's nothing in this that says that excludes Jews from owning Jerusalem. Nothing. Okay? So that's Article 25. Now let's skip forward to the article note by the Secretary General. So what this document is, this is the British notifying the League of Nations that uh, and confirm, or actually I think it's the League of Nations confirming the document. You know, it might be just the, the Brits. They're, no, they, this is the official notice that they're exercising their right as the mandatory power, which was Britain, that we're now going, we are officially going to withhold Jewish settlement from east of the Jordan River. Well, why would they do that if Jews weren't promised land there? Okay, so it references in the middle, memorandum by the British representative, and Article 25 of the Mandate for Palestine provides as follows. Um, in the territories lying between Jordan and the eastern boundary of Palestine, as ultimately determined, the mandatory is entitled with consent to postpone or withhold application. Then it goes on in two. In pursuance of the provisions of this article, His Majesties and Government invite the Council to pass the following resolution. Quote, the following provisions of the Mandate for Palestine are not applicable to the territory known as Transjordan, which comprises all territory lying to the east of a line drawn from a point two miles west of the town of Aqaba, which is uh, right where Elad is, excuse me, on the gulf of that name, up the center of the Wadi Araba, Dead Sea, and the River Jordan to its junction with the River Yarmouk sent up to the center of that river to the Syrian frontier. So this is, this is, those were the boundaries of Israel, Palestine, Israel. Can't get clearer than that. They, they divided it up all the way from, let's call it Elat, all the way up the Jordan, up the dead, the middle of the Dead Sea, up through the Jordan River. That's the Jewish homeland, folks. Can't get any clearer than that. So I talked to you about the choir we got to turn ourselves, and a moral argument. We're looking at a legal document, but I don't want you to get bogged down in legality. I never argue legalities. I don't argue legalities. We're not in a legal war. We're in a counter-propaganda war, and we've got to win it. To win it, we have to make a moral argument. And the moral argument 
essentially goes like this. And I've got some key points here on what to stay focused on. So I'm just going to give you the quickie. So this is the stuff we stay focused on. There can be no peace without truth. Jews have a land title deed from 1922 in which the world told Jews to rebuild their ancient national home. Its very existence proves uh, allegations of stolen land are false. The document returned all land west of the Jordan River, returned, returned, all land west of the Jordan River to the Jewish people, including Jerusalem. Uh, the document gave Jewish land east of the Jordan River to Arabs in what we now call the original two-state solution. So the world recognized that the Jews had a claim on land on both sides of the Jordan River. And then the world decided that to appease the Arabs in Jordan, they were going to take some of that Jewish land that was promised to them and give it to the Arabs. I don't know about you, but in my book, I call that a solution. I call that another a two-state solution. So <laughs> Jewish land has already been divided once. There's already been a two-state solution. And the world has never respected it, practically from the moment it, it, it was made. So, and then the next point. Um, many Jews died in the Holocaust because the world didn't keep its promises. Now the world wants to unjustly divide Jewish land again in a new, new two-state solution, and that's not fair. The world Jews couldn't trust the world's promises from 1922, so why should they trust new promises today? And the world has a duty to help preserve Jewish honor, especially considering all the terrible things it's done to Jewish people. So let's acknowledge the, Jew, the original two-state solution, the League of Nations mandate for Palestine, before we talk about any other solution. Everybody wants, whether it's a one-state solution or a two-state solution, everybody wants a solution. But I always try to be truthful, okay? Palestine was always the Jewish land. That's what the Romans named it Palestine to get to erase Jewish history. So, um, yeah, if you were talking about that. So they're actually on the Jewish part of the, of the homeland, okay? So the question is, because uh, I don't want to get into solutions. I'll talk, you know, we'll talk about that later. Um, the question is, what, what are we going to do with them? Well, I mean, what, what, but Mark, what are you going to do with them? That's why you don't talk about solutions. First, let's talk about truth. Uh, because the world should know, if you're going to have a solution, the Jews should, the, so I tell people, let's assume that we had a two-state solution tomorrow. Magic. Magic. There's a solution, it's all signed. Do you know what you just did? The Jewish people just falsely confessed under duress to occupation and ethnic cleansing. And what an awful stain on Jewish history. I think that would be an awful legacy. It's an insult to the people who died to create Israel. It's an insult to the people who defended it and built it. And it's a stain on, on children, your children's legacy. And I think if there's going to be any kind of solution, it needs to come after the world recognizes, no, Jews didn't steal this land. They actually do own it. Now, that may never come. And as, as I said to people, um, you, you have no peace now and you have no truth. So at least we could walk in the light of truth and we could stand and say, no, we're owners. Okay, deal with it. Then admit that, that this is what the world promised us. And then we can talk about whatever, we're gonna, whatever solution you imagine. Because that's the one thing that people don't understand. Is that once you decide that you're going to stand on truth, magical things will happen. Because all of a sudden, if the world starts understanding that Jewish people are standing up for their rights, and people are starting to grasp that, wow, this is, they've really been treated horribly by this narrative. This isn't fair. And as soon as that propaganda, this anti-Jew, anti-Israel propaganda, starts being exposed by the light of truth, then they're going to get really motivated for a solution. Then maybe, maybe Israel will say, or Egypt would say, hey, why don't you have, a, have your own state over here? Um, but essentially what you're doing is you're, you're undermining the power of the propaganda that the other side's doing. So that's, that's the whole goal of this. So anyways, so um, the problem that I see in most Israel advocacy um, is that we allow ourselves to get taken down rabbit holes. So um, somebody will say occupation. So um, and you'll say, well, no, uh, there's this mandate thing I heard about. And they'll say, yeah, but that was colonialist. And away you go. Was it colonialist? Was it not colonialist? 
No. You've got to be able to control the debate. So if somebody's saying to you, um, uh, no, that's not true, what you do is I say to them, well, excuse me, do you agree that the world made promises to the Jewish people and those promises are in the mandate for Palestine? No. Well, what am I talking to them for? Why would I talk to them? Unless I've got a group of people around me, that's fine. If you want to have a debate in an airline seat with somebody, go ahead, you know, if that's what you want to do. But I'm not going to waste my time fighting haters. I'm looking for the people who will really want to understand what's going on. So let me give you the narrative that I, w I, would, I would give. So somebody points at me, occupation. Well, you know, sorry, what's your name? Rob. Rob. Well, you know, Rob, there can be no peace without truth. And the truth is that the Jewish people are owners, not occupiers, because they have a land title deed from the original two-state solution. Uh, the, it was called the 1922 Mandate for Palestine, and the whole world um, gave it to the Jewish people and told them to rebuild their national home there. And now the world's trying to take it away from them. And a lot of Jews died because the world didn't keep its promises. Don't you think the world should be able to keep its promises, Rob? Now they're going to say, uh, the wall! There's a wall. Now, this is where this is where this is where the rubber meets the road. Well, listen, I'm glad to talk to you about any topic, but could we first agree that the world made promises to the Jewish people and that those promises were not kept? Could we do that? Well, I don't know. Well, would if I could show you a document that proves it, would you be interested in reading it? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And that's how you control the, the narrative. Don't let them drag you down into the illegalities, in, into, into these rabbit holes about, that are, are never endless. You've got to control the narrative. And, if, and again, if I, was in a, if I had a small group of people, I'd say, listen, would you like to see the document? What about you? Anybody want to see the document that proves this is nonsense? No? Okay. Then I'm not wasting my time. That's how I control the narrative. I'm not going to talk to you. I did a protest once. I stood there, and one guy came up to me. And I'm starting to talk to him. And, he, and I said, well, listen, I've got a piece of paper that'll, that'll explain it to you. No, no, I want to I talk about this. I said, well, if you don't trust me enough to even take a piece of paper from my hand, why would I bother talking to you? Oh. So he took the paper. The next day he came back, and he couldn't believe it. He checked it out. I was telling him the truth. And so that's how you control the narrative. Don't go down the rabbit holes, but you're going to get common objections. So one of the common objections is um, the mandate is too old. It's too old. So I'll say to, I had this objection from those people. You know, when I was in that apartment with the people who thought telling the truth was pretty radical, um, there was a lawyer there. And this guy, I'm telling you, this guy agonizes over Israel, agonizes over it. And he says, Mark, I, I see one big problem with your with your, with your approach. I said, really, what is it? The mandate's too old. It's not relevant. I said, it's too old. Is the U.S. Constitution too old? Are Aboriginal land treaties too old to be enforced? And I said, but really what you've done is you just proved something to me. You proved my whole point. Jews can't trust the world's promises. So that's immoral. So the whole point is, shouldn't Jews be able to trust the world's promises? I don't have to argue all the legalities. I don't have to argue archaeology. Shouldn't, should, yes or no, should Jews be able, to be able to trust the world's promises? So, and then you'll get the objection. But Mark, what about the UN resolution and this resolution and the wall decision and the opinion of the international court? And I'll say, um, were they before or after 1922? Well, they were after 1920. Well, thank you very much. You just proved again that the world can't trust the promises made to the Jewish people. And a lot of Jews died because those promises were kept, and shouldn't they be able to trust those promises? But Mark, what's the solution? I said, I'm really glad you asked that. There can be no peace without truth, and we can't build on lies. So the solution is to stop talking about solutions. Once the world accepts the truth, that the Jewish people are owners and not occupiers, and that may take five years, it may take ten years, it may never happen. But we're going to walk in the light of truth until that happens, and maybe a, a solution will present itself. Okay, That's the problem. And that's why truth before solutions 
is the number one thing on my list of core concepts. If you can grasp that. Because if you think about it from a practical point of view, um, the politicians are sheep. They are led by public opinion. And they blow in the breeze. Fortunately, I think you have some really great politicians in Israel. Um, but they watch public opinion. Our job is to create a parade for them to jump in front of and lead. Okay, let them think they're leading it. But our job is to make it popular again to talk about Israel's land rights. Now, one of the problems, of course, and, and underlining all this, the reason, because I have, you know, my non-Jewish friends especially, they'll say, well, Mark, this is amazing stuff. Why, don't they, why doesn't Israel talk about it? Do you know Israel does not even teach its own children about its history of land rights? Don't you think Jewish kids should read this document? I, I, I do. They should be reading that. They don't. And that's why CILR, Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, existed. They wanted, they were working with the Israeli government. They were hoping to get this into the curriculum, okay? Because as you can see, we're talking about the choir again. How can you possibly confront an occupation narrative, the, mor the immorality of that narrative, if you don't even know your own history? You can't do that. So that's what they wanted to do. Salomon ben Zimmer, the author of The Jewish People's Rights to the Land of Israel, was on his way home after meeting MKs in Israel, and he, had, he died right on the plane with a pen on his hand, achieving part of his dream of, of getting somebody in Israel to listen to what they're saying. So a lot of people, again, I'm going to emphasize it, they want solutions, solutions, solutions. The politicians, if you were going to have a solution by now, you would have it. You have pro the people who want a one-state solution, they got problems with a two-state solution. The people who, with the two-state solution, they have a problem with a one-state solution. I'm saying, let's, how about, first of all, let's recognize something. Ripping half of your country apart, where your ancient patriarchs and matriarchs walked and made history, and where all the tombs are, ripping that part of your country out and giving it, to people who have done nothing but kill you and attack you and vilify you and murder your children and murder your athletes, I don't regard that as a moderate solution. I'm sorry, that just doesn't strike me as being moderate. And even all the people in that were, who were in the room in that apartment with me, they're all two-state two solution. But I, I asked them, who, who of you actually believes that a two-state solution is going to work? Tell me, who, who's going to do that? Not one of them. Not one of them actually think it's going to work. Okay? So I'm in big on reality. Let's deal with reality. If we're going to talk about solutions, how about we talk about this one first? Then you can figure out what you're going to do. But let's walk in the light of truth. And we can hold our heads up high and say, maybe you're not going to like it. So my friends will say to me, um, Mark, why, why, why don't Jewish people talk about this? And I said, if I had to guess, I think it's because too many people walk in fear. They're, they don't want it to get worse. They've been beaten up and, and, and tormented, and they just want the pain to stop. And, you know, I think some of them just perceive that, well, you know, it could get more violent and probably would. Um, but if that's the case, then what makes you think the status quo is going to work without truth? I mean, how do you, how do you stop that? There was a friend of mine, a great supporter. I did a presentation, uh, or sorry, I was attending a presentation from the uh, European Coalition for Israel. And this man, uh, Thomas Sandel, Sandel uh, reaches out to high-level diplomats. I mean, inside the UN, they hold secret satyrs, he told me, um, with, with, his, with uh, Danny Danon. Is he the ambassador now? Or the UNN? Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, I asked him at a presentation, I said, why do you think it happened? It's like that. Why, why won't Jews talk about this? Because he knew. He was telling. He told us a story. He said, I went to Japan. And you know, Japan has a lot of guilt over World War II. And there aren't a lot of people that bring a lot of great news to, about Japanese history. And he goes and he met with Japanese parliamentarians. And he said, do you understand that it was Japanese people who were at the San Remo conference who helped make Israel possible? They were just moved by this stuff, okay? So he, he said, he's answering, he gave pretty much the same answer that I did. And my, my supporter stood up and she said, you know, I'm the daughter of Holocaust survivors. 
And she says, I think it's battered women. It's like battered women's syndrome. He said, Jewish people have been beaten down so much that we're afraid that it's just going to get worse. And you know, listen, you know, I, I didn't think a lot of it. I, I thought, oh, that makes sense. But you know, what has to happen for a beaten woman to regain her self-respect? She has to face the truth. She has to face the risk that, yeah, it could get worse. Because the most dangerous time in an abused woman's uh, life is when she leaves the abuser. Okay? And that's all I'm telling you. You've got to leave the abuser. You've got to embrace the light, embrace the truth. So let's just have a look-see. Now, there's one of my great uh, uh, comebacks. Okay? And again, it's, it's um, handly objections. So they'll say, um, let me think. Um, They'll make an objection about, oh, geez, I can't even think of what it would be. But I'll say, well, how does that change the fact? I always frame it back to the, yeah, remember this one. How does that change the fact that Jews were promised this land by the world, the re, were, were restored to this land by the world in their land title deed? Have you read the land title deed? Here's the link. Okay? We always want to link to the normal people. Okay? So when we're online, if I'm, if I'm dealing with a hater, it's always... Um, yeah, well, uh, have you read Israel's land title deed? And here's the, here's the link. Okay? And you'll see it in the role-playing uh, uh, things here. So that you're, you're, getting, you're leaving breadcrumbs for the normal people to find. Okay, so what about, what about XYZ objection? So here's Zoe, and she's saying, we're on, t- on page 30. But what about this objection? The wall, the barricades, the, or the, the checkpoints, or whatever. Again, Yossi, Yossi? There's really no point in going any further until you've read the mandate for Palestine. And we can agree Jews were given the right to rebuild their ancient home in Jewish Palestine by the world community. And that disproves the lies that you've been told. Um, and you can read it here. Would you like me to show you a copy? If you're in person, you might say, look, i got a copy right here. Would you like to read it? Don't let them take you down the rabbit holes. Because that's how they defeat you. The mandate was signed a long time ago. It's not relevant today. You see, you better understand something. If the world can ignore this two-state solution today, they can ignore a new two-state solution tomorrow, and 25 years from now, and 50 years from now. And anybody who has, I don't really get into it in here, although there's a little bit there, the goal is, you know, has anybody ever read the book uh, Son of Hamas? Okay. And I think it's Mossad. I can't think of his whole name now. He's the son of a Hamas founder. I got to meet him. He autographed my book. It was great. And he said the problem is that the world treats this as a political problem, when in reality it's a religious problem. And what he meant by that is that Israel was conquered by Islam. It must be conquered again. It's just, it's, that's just Islamic ideology. It has to be. And so it doesn't stop until all of Israel. If you've seen the maps for Palestine, um, we're not talking about the liberated areas here, Judea and Samaria. The map is all of Israel. They want the end of Israel. Okay? Um, We just have to understand that. So they are going to want it. So here's here's the thing. (laughs) Ask you. If you don't hold up your land title deed, to keep, to hang on to Judea and Samaria until the world, at least until the world recognizes you as owners, proper owners, what are you going to hold up when they want Tel Aviv? Because all by then, see, you, you own Judea and Samaria, you're titled to Judea and Samaria, comes from the same place. By what right do you own Tel Aviv? If, you, if you're going to give away to Judea and Samaria... Why not Tel Aviv? Why not Haifa? What's the difference? Wouldn't it be better to hold this up today and say, no, no, we're owners, not occupiers. Okay, the, the jig's up, guys. We're owners, not occupiers. So, and then again, the UN resolutions. Well, I love that question. And, and, you know, this is the beauty of it. I had three go-rounds with this professor of international law who actually crea- negotiates treaties. Okay. So, by the time I'm done, I don't th- he won't admit that I beat him, but I'll tell you, 
Ted Bellman, who is not given if you, is, is not given to effusive praise, wrote to me and said, "Mark, I was very impressed with your your contributions to this, because I, a non-lawyer, using nothing than what I taught you, now you could go out with this booklet right now and take on the same guy with a little bit of practice, because in the end I said to him." Look, you, you, you're giving me all these reasons and denigrating the, the mandate for Palestine, but not once have you said it didn't exist. Not once have you said the world didn't make promises to the Jewish people. Not once did you say those promises were kept. But yet you want Jews to trust new promises? I said, in reality, because of course then they start getting personal. I always like it when they get personal because then they start losing the argument. Now it's got to get personal, right? And I love that. And he, you just don't understand or appreciate international law. And I said, no, my friend, you're the one who doesn't appreciate international law because you're out negotiating treaties that you know can be abrogated simply through lies and violence. So which one of us actually has respect for international law? I do. Ted Bellman does. So let's talk about the international law. Let's do that. Going to get, it might be hard, Okay. So I love it when they throw the UN resolutions at you, at me. I love it. Was that before or after 1922? Oh, it was after. Sorry, you just proved that Jews can't trust the world's promises. And the reason that's so powerful is we're not making a legal argument. Because most people would say, well, no, it's relevant because of this or, you know, and this Latin phrase and this legal term. And, and no, we've got to make the moral argument because that's what was used against you. Okay. British, uh, the mandate was a British colonialist document. That's another one. The, old, the too old objection, that's the most common one, and that's the easiest one of all. I love that one. Uh, the colonialist document, well, the easy way to, to do that, if you don't know the history, there's enough information here, and if you watch the video, um, there's a video in here about uh, Solomon Ben Zimmer. I'm on 31, right at the top thing. Uh, we're always saying the mandate was a British colonialist document. If you look in the bottom of that top box, you'll see a, uh, there's a link there um, to a video of Salomon Ben Zimra from Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights. And if you go watch that, we recorded that specifically as a training video to be used exactly for this. And thank goodness we have this because uh, he's, he's no longer with us. And he explains all of this stuff in there. And he goes through the maps and the history of the mandate and, uh, and all of that stuff. So it was not a colonialist document. The whole point was to eliminate colonialism. So you're able to read that yourself. And, you know, you'll have, well, they're just defending their homeland. You know, these role plays can go anyway. I can't give you a silver bullet. If you're looking for a silver bullet that's magically going to take them out, this, you know, I can't give you that. All I can give you is the best thing, the thing that's most effective. And I'm going to tell you something, most effective. When, you're, when I'm online and I start doing the mandate stuff, nobody wants to take me on. They'll take me on for two or three tweets, and then that's it, and then I get blocked. Because they know this stuff. And I'll show you how, how important it is. Um, so, I mean, you're, you always want to treat people, though, when you're interacting with people, even the most vicious of them. Um, I always treat them as misguided. I don't want to call them liars unless they've really shown themselves to be liars. I always want to, I always want to treat them as somebody who's been misled. So I position that with, with them. So in this, in this bo bottom one on 31, um, I'll say, uh, you know, I suggest you read Mandate for Palestine and the Hamas Charter, and then ask yourself, do I really want to be spreading lies to, to aid today's racist Nazis in pursuing a new Holocaust? against Jews, or do I want to be speaking out for truth and justice on behalf of a truly persecuted people? And then I give them, a, you know, there's a link to the Hamas charter, okay? It's always, um, and some Jews really have a problem with this idea of portraying themselves as victims, and I really understand that. Um, think of it as, you're the underdog. You're the underdogs. You've been cheated. The world cheated you. They wrote this document and then did their best to ignore it, and I think it's outrageous. So, and then we'll talk about solutions. And again, my solution, you want to know what my solution is? It's time to call a moratorium on all solutions. Now I don't have to argue, guess what? Now I don't have to argue solutions, do I? Let's have a moratorium. And now, now you'll have the one-staters, this one-state people, you have a moratorium, wait, I had this this lady from, uh, from uh, Judea, Samaria, and uh, but Mark, we don't want to leave any chance 
that they could ever resurrect this two-state solution. And she was, she was very adamant about that. I said, you better understand something. What you're trying to do is kill the elephant and eat the elephant all in the same day. What I'm suggesting to you is that if you, call, if you could get the Israeli government to call a moratorium on all solutions. And wouldn't that be nice? A politician doesn't have to make a decision. All he has to decide is, are Jews owners or occupiers? We convince Bibi of that, and we convince and we show him, like, look, you can avoid all the one-state arguments and all the two-state solutions. Why don't you just call a moratorium? Well, I'm pretty sure by the time this, this curriculum gets through to Jewish people and Jewish kids and out into the world, Maybe they're not going to want to give up Judea and Samaria anymore. Maybe they won't. Maybe they will. I don't know. But if it's going to happen, it should happen after the world acknowledges that you're owners. You're going to say, Mark, the world's never going to do that. Because, I mean, one of my, what I would suggest you do is you get the Israeli government or, a, or, an, or an Israeli uh, uh, NGO to draft a request for, a, for an apology from the United Nations. Article 80 of the UN Charter, they sometimes call it the Palestine Article, and that article guarantees all prior existing rights under previous instruments. The United Nations had an obligation to protect the rights acquired in the mandate. Are they? No. So what you need to do is you've got to put the UN defensive. Hey guys, here's our land title deed. You need to recognize Jews as owners, not occupiers. Now, you're in, but Mark, they're never going to do that. I know they're never going to do that, probably, in my lifetime. But guess what? It puts them on the defensive. And then Bibi stands up and says, yeah, we're not talking about any solutions until the world acknowledges our land title deed, the mandate for Palestine. The next day, you're going to have all these report Man Mandate for Palestine? What the heck is that? Okay. Um, and now you've put the world on defensive. Now you've got people, well, what is this Jewish land title? What, what the heck is Because I guarantee it, four of you in this room who are motivated enough to come and hear me speak, only four of you have read your own land title deed. Well, guess what? Is it any wonder that your kids are going into university and being convinced that, that Israel is a monster, monstrous occupier? I, 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 it's not a question of why are they doing it. Why wouldn't they be doing it? Because nobody's teaching them. Okay? That's our job. That's our job of the choir. We've got to teach them their own history. Okay. This is strategic deployment of a moral narrative. This is what Israel can do. So, hence strategic. So, one day I'm, I'm, I wake early in the morning, and I've got this, as I'm, and I'm thinking, what speech would I want Bibi to give if I could write it for him? And it's bizarre because, you know, um, it's like somebody put the words into my head. And I'm, I don't know, 2 o'clock in the morning. I said, I've got to write this down. And I wrote, the, I wrote a speech for Bibi. It's called Truth Before Solutions, A New Path to Peace, in which he announces that Israel is declaring a moratorium on all solutions um, until the world rec under, you know, re acknowledges its promises to the Jewish people. And so if you'll read it later, we're not going to do it now, when you read the speech, you'll understand, you'll see how we craft in the moral argument, always the moral argument, but based on legality of the document. Okay? Trust me, if I can, I can teach Bibi how to overcome the objections. Imagine Bibi on CNN during the last Gaza War. Instead of stumbling about not having peace partners and all this, Bibi said, well... You know, Jake, uh, there can be no peace without truth, and the Jewish people are owners, not occupiers, because we have a land title deed that the world gave us in 1922. And so we're not going to talk about any solutions until the world recognizes that we are owners, not occupiers. And thank you very much, Jake. Can you imagine that? Wow. Okay. Be awesome. Okay, so you read that, read that, and understand the integration of the moral argument that's missing from virtually all Israel advocacy today. Okay, action plan. NGOs, education about the mandate and how to use it. There are people in the world who teach the mandate stuff, but they don't understand how to use it to make the moral argument. And without, without using it as a moral argument at a tactical and a strategic level, 
it's not going to get you very far. It, just putting the document in front of people, it's a start, but you've got to show them the, the immorality of the world not keeping its promises to Jewish people. How about mandate for Jewish Palestine Day? Who's heard of Al Quds Day? Anybody? A few? Okay. How about mandate for Jewish Palestine Day? I'll go there. I'd love that one. And uh, lobby the Israel government to do this plan. Now, um, in uh, earlier this year, I have been telling my Jewish friends forever, guys, somebody please petition the UK government for an apology for all the Jews that died because, because Britain kept them out of Palestine before World War II. <clears throat> I don't think anybody's done it yet. Um, well, in May of this year, I believe it was, um, some Palestinian group petitioned the UK government to apologize for the Balfour Declaration. <coughs> so, Jewish groups were sending out their reply. And if you read the first part of the reply, it said, uh, UK is proud of its role in creating the State of Israel and does not intend to, reply, intend to apologize. I said, well, you've got to click on the rest of it. And they were actually sending this out to people. Well, when you read the rest of it, the UK government is telling this guy, um, yes, we realize we should have included um, rights of self-determination for the Palestinian people in the Balfour Declaration. So the UK government, I wrote an article in Times of Israel, the UK government is rewriting the Balfour Declaration a hundred years later. And the Palestinian people were the Jews. That's why it's called the Mandate for Palestine, that, it, that is all about the Jewish national home. This is the idiocy. This is the danger of being silent about this stuff. And the longer it goes on, the worse it's going to get. Now you may say, Mark, how does that affect your narrative? doesn't hurt me. This is just another example of how the Jews can't trust the world's promises. Okay? I don't have to argue anything else. Can't trust the world's promises. Okay? Um, and file a demand. Um, um, you know, again, apology for the UK. Number three, ask uh, that the UN officially recognize Israel's land rights and institute a moratorium on all solutions and then include education about land rights history. Your kids should never go to bed one more night thinking that their people stole land. Because that, that, and that's what I do. I try to work to prevent that. Thank you so much. You've been a great audience. And, uh,